Okay, we'll continue uh, our exploration of the ISA today and uh, probably uh, next Wednesday too. I don't expect uh, we'll finish ISA today, but hopefully it will be exciting. Have you guys done the readings? Yes? That's good. Oh, uh, a couple of announcements. One is, I believe the Patterson and Hennessy book is available as an e-book at the library. Is that correct? Not yet? Okay, we don't know yet. But it will be available as an e-book, but th there's a physical copy there that was placed there by Yungu. So you should be able to get it. Uh, and other books will be placed as time goes by. Uh, the other announcement, Jason, who is your third TA, is sitting in the back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can say hi to him. Mm, did I have anything else? Well, I guess let's go and see. You already know that you have homeworks due, and I do want this homework zero uh, as, uh, as a hard copy with your picture on it, okay? At the beginning of next lecture. And homework one, you can turn it in via Blackboard, right? Is that the, no, a hand in directory. Okay, initially we said we wanted the homeworks via Blackboard, but that's a very cumbersome system. So you're gonna put your homeworks in the hand in directory. That'll make life easier for everyone, I think. Is everybody excited about using Blackboard for some reason? No, okay, you, you guys don't like it either? Okay. And why do we use it, I guess that's. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get rid of it. Uh, mostly, I think. I guess still for grades we may need to use that, but uh, I'll let you know. I guess we'll, yes? I'm assuming it's in PDF version? Uh, yeah, PDF version, that's. Uh, you, can, you can scan a handwritten version also if, if you need to draw figures. And feel free to draw figures if you want to explain things. Uh, in, oftentimes in computer architecture, when I try to explain an idea, drawing figures uh, comes in very handy because we're, we're like architects, right? You're, you're actually building stuff. And you will see in some of my lecture notes, I will draw the figures beforehand and scan it and put it in my lecture notes. So don't be surprised when you see that. It's a lot easier to draw by hand than draw by PowerPoint. Maybe you guys are much better at PowerPoint than I am, so that's, I should speak for myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, so homework one, this is, this is actually also old copy-paste there. Homework one is already out, uh, and some of you have already started it. Uh, there are a bunch of questions. Uh, again, homeworks are for your benefit, so do the questions. Not necessarily for the grade, do the questions to understand the material. And lab assignment is out also, start early. And we'll have uh, sessions, lab sessions, as well as recitation sessions that, to help you out. Go to the recitation sessions you want whenever you need help. Uh, not the recitation sessions, but the lab sessions. There will be separate recitation sessions when we don't have a lecture. Okay? Any questions on these? So far. Yes? Regarding the uh, performance evaluation stuff in the first time, will we be covering that in the last part of 28? Uh, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> but if not, if, if we find out that we won't cover it, uh, we. Uh, we will uh, postpone the questions for the next lab, uh, ne next homework. But if you can do it without covering it, that's, that's even better. Okay? Okay. Uh, these are readings for next time. Uh, we're going to go into implementation soon, uh, microarchitecture basically. So I have assigned the Patterson and Hennessy chapter four, sections 4.1 through 4.4, as well as uh, Pat and Patel uh, book that has a revised appendix C that describes LC3B microarchitecture. And this is online, you can get to it. And there's an optional reading, but I encourage you to look at it. Uh, this should be uh, LC3 ISA chapter five uh, in Pat and Patel. We'll cover a lot of these concepts uh, from that chapter uh, today. Okay, I guess last lecture, I'll ask you a couple of questions to warm you up. We, d we covered von Neumann architecture, and we covered an alternative to it, right, which was a data flow architecture. So you can tell me what are the two key characteristics of the von Neumann architecture. Yes? What was the first one? Sequence, like, uh, instructions, like sequence. Okay, sequential instruction processing, yes, that's one. Uh, 
So sequential, uh, yeah, that's exactly the same. You're right. So you you, t you told me one, which is the sequential instruction processing. An instruction uh, needs to finish before the next instruction gets started, right? And that's the soul of von Neumann architecture, actually. The second one is yes. That's right, yeah, stored program concept. Basically, program is stored in memory and there's no distinction between instructions and data except when you uh, use, uh, except when you access uh, the value uh, makes the difference between instructions and data, how you interpret it, right? So those are two key characteristics. But the soul is really the sequential instruction processing, which is enabled by the program counter, facilitated by the program counter. And we've seen the alternative, which has no program counter, the data flow model, right? And I guess I'll have two questions for you over here that you kind of covered last time. What difficulty does the data flow model uh, at the ISA level, at the instruction level, pose to the programmers? You covered this, right? You have, you don't have some notion if you have a data flow model. Who wants to be the brave one? <laughs> yes? So I guess it makes it really hard to debug. That's right, yes. Why, why does it make it really hard to debug? You got it right. Like, what, what are you missing? Yes? You theoretically don't know where you are in the program or what state you're in. Exactly. Precise state. You don't know the precise state uh, you are in the program when the, when, a, uh, when the program is executing. Right. Because the execution order of instructions is determined by the availability of the data for those instructions and the availability of data in turn is uh, can be dependent on different latencies, right? Depends on where the data is and it may be non-deterministic even depending on when the input is made. Which means that the programmer has no idea which instructions have completed and which instructions have not completed at any point in time. Whereas with the sequential instruction model uh, sequential processing model, von Neumann model, it's clear, right? You can, you can execute only one instruction and the instruction at that current program counter is the one that is being executed. All instructions before that is finished, all instruc no instruction after that is started. You know exactly the precise state. So you can figure out what your register should be, what your memory should be. So that's the main difficulty. We will see this a little bit later on when we cover multiprocessing. Multiprocessing is kind of similar to data flow, not exactly, but when you have multiple threads, again, it's harder, it becomes harder for the programmer to reason about what the state is, state of the program is, because different threads can modify different locations in an asynchronous way. In a sense, data flow is completely asynchronous, right? There is no, uh, there is no single flow of control, okay? Okay, I guess the next question is, how is this difficulty eliminated? Uh, so what is the benefit of data flow? Data flow enables a lot of parallelism, right? Inherent parallelism. In fact, uh, it's called irregular parallelism. You can exploit uh, uh, parallelism that's irregular in the programs. We will see, uh, in ten, 10 lectures later or so, we will see different ways of uh, improving the concurrency or parallelism in programs so that you can get more performance. There are forms of parallelism that are very regular. Versus irregular. So what's an example of irregular? Let's say you have an array. And you have another array. And you want to add these arrays together to form a destination, which is you want to do this basically. CI, I is the ith element of the array, AI plus BI. And you, let's say the arrays are both one million elements long, which means that you do the same operation on one million different elements, right? So this is very regular because you're doing the same operation on a million pieces of data. This is also called single, so this regular parallelism can be exploited very easily by what's called uh, single instruction multiple data machines. Or you may have heard of vector machines. These machines have instructions that operate on multiple data elements. So basically you can express this as, like this, add 
uh, C B A. And inherently, there's a single instruction and that operates on a million elements. Make sense? So this is very regular. You can do this with a single instruction. In fact, today's GPUs operate based on the same principle, graphics processing units. And we will cover that when we get to that also. You will see the fundamental principles of how a GPU operates. It's the same thing, regular parallelism. Data flow is completely opposite, right? It can exploit very irregular parallelism. It can, it basically you can have an arbitrary data flow graph, right? And there may be many, many dependencies. And the instructions basically fire when their data is available. Whereas this kind of irregular parallelism is very difficult to exploit in a vector machine, right? Now you go back to a single instruction, single data, instead of instructions have, uh, operating on many, data, many pieces of data, okay? So this was an aside, but data flow is very good at extracting this irregular parallelism that's in programs. And when we get to this, you'll, uh, I'll ask you to contrast data flow to uh, regular parallelism machines, SIMD machines, vector machines. Okay, so that's the benefit. So we would like to get that benefit, but we don't want the downside of data flow at the ISA level, because that's hard to debug, right? So how, do we, how can we achieve both? Say it again. I heard something. Out of order execution. Out of, okay, yes, out of order execution. Which means? Uh, that you look at the instruction, of omnipotent instruction stream coming in, and mm -hmm. figure out uh, in real time how you can parallelize mm -hmm. the next however many instructions. Okay, yeah, we didn't go into that much detail, but the idea is you still keep the von Neumann interface at the ISA level, which is sequential instruction processing, but underneath the microarchitecture dynamically figures out the dependencies between instructions and forms the data flow graph in hardware. So the programmer doesn't need to provide the data flow graph. ISA is still sequential, but the hardware figures out what instructions can be executed in parallel, okay? And we will cover that. Right now it's okay if, if this is conceptual. You don't need to know how, that, how the hardware exactly does that. We'll cover that. Okay. Any, any questions? I guess I'll uh, just go through these. These are the slides that answer the questions. So you can look at this. Yeah. So basically, whether or not you want data flow at the ISA level, or data flow at the microarchitecture level is a trade-off, right? And today, uh, most machines at the microarchitecture level implement out-of-order execution, which is basically forming the data flow graph on the fly in hardware. Okay, I guess this is just for fun. You remember this slide, right? What is, what is the property of the ISA? What is the property of microarchitecture? It's the same thing. You should be able to answer these questions. Okay. And we also covered the design point, and we also covered uh, why computer architecture is somewhat an art, because we do not know what workloads we're going to execute, what applications and what users we're going to deal with. Right? And it's very hard to model this. You could try to take the scientific approach also, but it's very hard to model the future, right? Because there are many, many factors. This is even worse than weather modeling, probably. What kind of factors do you actually put in? Okay, so today we'll cover the ISA level trade-offs. And so let's start. These are all review slides. Okay, uh, there have been many different ISAs over decades, and I don't expect you to remember all of these. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on some of them. Today, one of the most dominant ISAs is XCD6. I guess we don't have uh, the other big ISAs. Oh, it's, it's at the very, very end, that was not intentional. <laughs> X86 and ARM are quite uh, common ISAs, at least in the general purpose or general enough purpose uh, domain. Uh, but there have been many, many ISAs over decades, uh, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, I'll especially cover uh, the VAX ISA sometimes, uh, and the Alpha ISA. And uh, these were actually PDP, VAX, and Alpha are the ISAs that uh, were designed by the Digital Equipment Corporation, which was one of the biggest uh, machine manufacturers of its time in the 70s, starting from late 60s, 70s, 
80s. And these were the dominant ISAs for the mainframes and uh, later microprocessors. And I'll give you some historical perspective over here also. So PDP was extended with virtual address extensions. That's why it's called VAX. And VAX was later, uh, I guess there was a backlash against VAX within Digital Equipment Corporation because it was one of the most complex ISAs of the world. I, I don't want to claim that it's, it was the most complex ISA, but it was the most complex commercially successful ISA of the world potentially, that's true. And alpha is uh, uh, essentially much more simple. Simple meaning, I guess we'll see, uh, we'll look at what are the fundamental differences between these ISAs. Simple means instructions are simple. VAX had instructions that operated on doubly linked lists. So you could have an instruction that inserted an element into a double linked list. That's relatively complex, right? You don't see those instructions in the MIPS ISA you're going to implement. Whereas alpha uh, was much simpler. It didn't have a data type called double linked list. And we'll cover the data types today. So what are the fundamental differences? Uh, we'll take a look at, uh, we don't, we'll not, we're not going to cover all of the ISAs, but we're going to cover uh, what, what makes an ISA an ISA and what the kind of design choices you can make and how do they affect uh, the system, complexity, performance potentially, uh, and how instructions are specified and what they do, and how complex are the instructions. Complexity is an important one. I don't know if we will get to it today, but uh, we'll get to it in the, uh, in the next lecture for sure. So I'd like you to, again, uh, keep in mind that even though we're going to look at single instruction, like I say, this this is another type of ISA, right? Single instruction, multiple data. Basically, uh, there were ISAs that contained these vector instructions that operate on vectors. Single instruction doesn't operate on only multiple or two pieces of data elements. You can actually do the same operation. Instead of having one add, you can do it on a billion uh, data elements, right? So keep that in mind. And we will at some point cover the VLIW ISAs, although I'm not going to focus on them uh, in the next two lectures. These are ISAs where uh, you have multiple operations that are independent, packed in a single instruction. So this is your instruction. It's called very long instruction word. And you can have an add, multiply, load at the same time. And compiler or the programmer guarantees that these instructions are independent. And now you can design hardware that can execute these instructions in parallel. You fetch one instruction that can execute these operations within an instruction in parallel. It's called very long instruction word. This is another way of improving parallelism, right? Instead of specifying instruction, uh, a single operation in an instruction, you specify many operations. Except it's not regular now, right? Here, it was regular. Same instruction on different pieces of data. Here, different instructions on different pieces of data. That's the difference between VLIW and SIMD. And these are also ISAs, right? These are different instruction formats. And also keep in mind that you can mix and match, right? You can, you can have vector instructions as well as scalar instructions. Scalar instruction is basically add R1, R2, R3, right? This is scalar. It's only on one piece of data. Whereas if you have vector, it's on a million pieces. Make sense? OK. So these are all choices that you make when you design an ISA today. Do you want to have vector instructions? That's a choice. And many of today's ISAs actually do have vector instructions, although we will see that they're not pure vector machines. So uh, how many of you have heard of Cray supercomputers? OK, good. <laughs> You guys are old. <laughs> okay, or, or you read well, that's, that's even better. <laughs> uh, so those supercomputers were designed to operate on arrays, uh, large, large matrices, and that's why they incorporated these vector instructions into the ISA. So the application space, remember, the design point determines what instructions you actually put in your computer. And their, their main mode of operation was operation on vectors or matrices, that's why these instructions were very, very important. And that was the main kind of instructions in their machine. But they did need to have scalar operations as well. 
So their ISAs consist of vector operations as well as scalar operations. Well, why scalar operations? Because they need to do branching, right? Sometimes they need to have control flow to change. Maybe you want to operate on this part of the matrix versus that part of the matrix, right? Today, uh, like the x86 ISA contains many scalar operations, but it does also contain these single instruction multiple data operations as well, instructions. Do you guys know why? Or why it was introduced into x86? Yes, multimedia um, capabilities. Exactly, yes. So the reason was not to operate on these large matrices because x86 was never designed, the application space of x86 was never uh, large scale scientific computing, but it was more general purpose, user oriented, client based computing. And it turned out users watched video, right? Manipulated images. Well, if you look at images, video, what do they look like? They have these blocks and you have pixels, right? And you can have many, many pixels in an image, right? If you have 1024 by 1024 image or frame, you have a million pixels. And let's say you want to zoom in. Well, you do the same operation on blocks of pixels. Right? Same operation on many different data elements. That looks like SIMD, right? Vector. So Intel introduced these extensions. Initially, they were called MMX, multimedia extensions, to the x86 ISA. That way you would handle this kind of operations. Again, based on the application space, right? Application space, it's a, such an important application for users uh, to do video, right? That's why these were introduced in the ISA. So ISA actually evolves over time also. And many of these ISAs have evolved also, and we will see some of that. But keep this in mind also. We'll get back to this all uh, again. I think right now it's called SSC, streaming SIMD extensions, right? Is it AVX now? Yes. There you go, you guys are more up to date than I am. <laughs> but the fundamentals don't change, right? The key is really fundamentals. It could be named, I don't know, a cat. <laughs> but it's still, fundamentally, it's a SIMD operation. Okay, single instruction, multiple data. Okay, I guess I don't want to spend 10 more lectures on this slide, so let's move on. <laughs> And there, there are some acronyms here that you, you may not recognize, uh, but we will cover some of them. RISC, for example, is Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And we'll get to that when we cover complex versus simple instructions. So VAX had very, very complex instructions. And the idea in RISC is to have exactly the opposite, very simple instructions. The goal, to design the hardware to be simple. Whereas VAX, the hardware needs to be complex, right? You need to the hardware designer somehow needs to uh, add an instruction that operates on a doubly linked list. And there's one more here, EPIC, you may have heard of. IA64, uh, Intel's IA64 architecture, which is very similar to VLIW. Again, the idea in VLIW is to simplify the hardware so that you can execute multiple operations in parallel, but the compiler or the programmer specifies which operations can be executed in parallel, okay? So all of these ISAs have different, uh, a different place in terms of hardware complexity versus compiler or programming complexity. Again, we're going back to programmer versus microarchitect, right? Where you, where you put the hardware software interface determines who needs to do more work, okay? And we'll cover some of those. But the basic thing uh, in an ISA is the instruction, right? It's the basic element of this hardware software interface. Software says, uh, do this, and that's specified by the instruction, and hardware obeys. And it consists of two things. Uh, the opcode, what the instruction does, or what the instruction should do, and the operands, who it is to do it to. Who should this ad be applied to, right? And in this SIMD ISA, it was clear, right? The ad should be applied to uh, the million elements of these two vectors and should be stored here, right? 
This, is, this could be your instruction. Right? Example from the Alpha ISA, this is from the Alpha Architecture Handbook, which should be on, online, uh, from a link from the course webpage. But you can see, let's take a look at one of the instructions here. This is the operate instruction. Uh, you have an opcode and you have two source registers and a destination register. And this function also specifies an extension of the opcode. And we will see some of these. Memory instruction, branch instruction, and there's something called PAL code. You guys know what that is? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it, <laughs> maybe. This is the micro-coded uh, version. You can, you can think of these as traps also. Basically, these are instructions that enable an interface, and underneath, uh, the instruction is implemented in microcode. But let's, let's defer that for now. So some system functions are implemented this way, for example. For example, a page fault handler. Okay. Okay, so instruction's simple, right? And the ISA is a set of instructions also, right? And this is one of the, let me see, I should have the, no, I don't have it here. Okay, there it is. This, for example, document specifies the LC3B ISA, which I will cover in addition to MIPS. And this is basically the ISA specification. It's, it's a small ISA, it's a little computer, it's a toy ISA, but it, it demonstrates a lot of the things that uh, we will cover. This is basically, uh, what, what does the ISA specify? It specifies the set of instructions. LC3B has, I guess, 14 instructions, right? Which is a very small ISA. Uh, and these are the instructions you can see. It specifies the encoding, and specifies uh, what the instruction is supposed to do. So if you look at uh, LC3B, for all instructions, the opcode is at the top four bits. It's a 16-bit ISA. Each instruction is a 16-bit uh, entity. And uh, we will cover later on that having the opcode in the same location makes the hardware simple, right? Because now the decoding logic, instruction decoding logic, just can look at those bits. But that's not true for many ISAs, actually. x86, for example, if you look at x86, the opcode can be in different places. Okay? So I guess I'll point out uh, some things uh, as we go along. Uh, but I'd encourage you to go through this. I didn't make it required reading, but at some point it'll be required anyway because you'll need to do homework based on this. But if you familiarize with this, uh, familiarize yourself with the instructions here, that would be useful. It's very simple, it's just an ISA specification. And as I said earlier, I like reading these manuals, and I'll give you examples from some of these manuals. Some of them are quite insightful, and we will cover some of them. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, one particular instruction here, which is the add instruction. Uh, there's something interesting here. Uh, if you look at add, you have the opcode, the destination register specifier, source register one specifier. Well, there's no source register two specifier here, right? But there's some bits called the A bit here. So A bit is actually a steering bit. Many ISAs use this, and I'll give you an example later on. Uh, you could think of this as kind of like the opcode also, right? So the idea is, this bit determines the interpretation of the other bits that are coming uh, later in this case. Let me see if I have, oh, I don't have it here. But I, uh, so if you take the add instruction here, uh, it has two formats. And let me show you those two formats. Even regular ISAs have this. I'll just copy whatever is there. You have 0001 as the opcode, and then destination register, and then source register one, and then one bit called the steering bit. If this is zero, then the rest of the instruction should look like this.
again, this is the opcode of add, uh, destination register, source register one, steering bit. If this is one, then the rest of the instruction looks like this. It's a five bit immediate. And this is bit zero through five, right? I guess six through eight, nine through 11. And I hope I'll be able to do calculations. Okay, 12 through 15. Okay, so depending on the value in the steering bit, the instruction <coughs> behaves differently, right? If the value is zero, then the instruction is, should do this. Destination register equals source register one plus source register two, which is this one. If this bit is one, then the instruction specified to do this. Destination register should get the value of source register one plus this immediate value five directly from the instruction. And in this case, it's sign extended because that's what the ISA specifies, right? We just read it from here, okay? So this concept of steering bit is important because you could think of this as part of the opcode also, right? It's really enabling you to uh, add more power to your instructions. Now you can have more expressibility. It, all, it is also kind of determining the addressing mode, as we will get to next. It's, it tells you where the second uphand of the ad is coming from. Is it coming from a register, or is it coming from an immediate embedded in the instruction? Okay? So I guess there is no perfect way of designing an ISA really, right? <laughs> this is again another kind of art. You want to minimize these kind of disruptions in your ISA if you want it to be very regular. So this kind of uh, reduces the beauty of the ISA a little bit, right? If you look at it, everything is regular here in the opcode, but you need to also examine this bit to determine where the second operand is coming from. Okay, so I, I won't go into all of these, but you can take a look at it. And this same thing exists in Alpha also. Alpha, remember, that's the last major ISA of the Digital Equipment Corporation. It's a beautiful ISA, but it looks very similar, to, and this is a real ISA. People have implemented uh, Alpha machines. It was, in fact, Alpha 21264, uh, designed in 1997, was the fastest machine of its time. It was 500 megahertz at that time. At that, for, the, for that time, it was very fast. And it had out of order execution. Uh, it had a lot of novel concepts also. But if you look at this, this is the operate instruction format. Very similar, opcode, uh, RA, RB, I guess set to be zero, or should be zero, I think it should be zero, that's right. <laughs> and this is the steering bit, zero. If the steering bit is zero, then, uh, well I guess it's RB field specifies a source register operand. If the steering bit is one, then this, this entire field specifies a literal. Literal is the same thing as an immediate. Same concept, except uh, it's like a little bit scrambled around, right? And the literal is interpreted as a positive integer between zero and 255, hopefully they have eight bits, and is zero extended to 64 bits. So if you look at this, the instruction size here is 32 bits, whereas LC3B has an instruction size of 16 bits. And the opcode here, uh, has uh, five bits, which means that you can have more instructions than the alpha ISA, right? Okay, these are all simple, right? Are you guys all familiar with this stuff? Were you familiar with the bit steering concept, the steering bit concept? Okay, good. Okay, what are the elements of an ISA? Uh, other than instructions also. Instruction sequencing model, we've already covered this. I'm not gonna spend more time on this. Control flow versus data flow, right? Sequential versus data flow, and you know the trade-offs very well. There's also instruction processing style. I call it the instruction processing style because there's no good name for this, I think. But this specifies uh, the number of operands an instruction operates on and how it does so. Uh, in a different way than the instruction sequencing model. Uh, and you guys may have heard of some of these. Stack machines, accumulator machines, uh, Two address, three address machines. Are you familiar with these? Who's familiar with it? 
Not everyone. OK. So we'll, we'll take a look at it. There's a homework question that you will do related to this topic. It's, uh, it's a fundamental concept. You don't see stack machines that uh, much today, although some of the calculators are still stack machines and accumulator machines, I believe. <laughs> Is that true? You see them in software. You see them in software. That's right. That's right. I mean, you can, you can implement any abstraction on top of uh, an ISA. That's right. But I, think, I, I believe some of the calculators still operate as stack machines because it's very simple. And I'll give you some examples. I'll, so the idea is uh, how many operands does an operate instruction have? You can distinguish machines based on that. So we've looked at here. I guess it's gone now. I'll make it appear again. We've looked at an ad here, right? Uh, and I've written R1, R2, R3. You have three different operands, three different addresses that you can specify. So this is a three address machine. But it doesn't have to be the case. A zero address machine, which is a stack machine, does this. Add. That's your operate instruction. Operands are implicit. Where are they? Well, they're at the top of the stack. So basically, you have a stack. And this operates, a stack is a last in first out data structure, right? You guys have all programmed with stacks, hopefully. Uh, basically, if you want to add two values, what you need to do is place those two values at the top of the stack and have an add instruction in the program. How do you place values on top of the stack? Let's say we want to add A and B. You push A, which basically takes, you have some memory somewhere, that is A, and that A is placed on top of the stack. That's what, the, uh, that's what this instruction does. And the top of stack is incremented. Right? This is a part of the hardware. And then let's say you push B. That's how you get B on top of the stack. And the same thing happens with B. And then if you do an add, now this add implicitly operates on the two elements on top of the stack. Right? And the idea is the machine takes the two elements, it computes A plus B, and places the results on top of the stack, and then decrements the stack pointer. Now you have A plus B on top of the stack after this add instruction. Now how do you get this back to main memory? Well, what you can do is you can pop. But of course, you need to specify where should this top of stack now go to, right? Let's say you want to put the value into C. Pop C instruction takes the value on top of the stack and places it into memory location C and decrements the stack pointer. Now the stack is empty at this point. Make sense? It's very simple. Uh, now you can similarly have a one address machine. Here you don't have any registers, right? No concept of registers here. Everything happens on the stack. Uh, I guess before we go into the next one, Let's look at the advantages of this. I guess I've given you one advantage. What is the advantage of this? Simplicity, simplicity right? It's very simple, that's right. Uh, why is it simple? Because one main reason is you have very small instruction size, right? Instruction size meaning the operate instructions at least. You do not need to specify the operands. And if you're, what you're doing is a very large sequence of calculations, you can have very compact code. Add, multiply, divide. You can basically string them together. OK. Second, maybe you haven't thought of this, but this is actually a big advantage of the stack machines. Uh, you get a very efficient procedure calls. If you're doing procedure-based, function-based programming, all parameters are on the stack. Right? Functions, normally, when you, do, uh, you need to pass parameters to different functions. right? You need to copy data from one place to another. Here, you don't need to do that. There are no additional cycles for parameter passing. I guess what is the downside? You can, you can come up with other upsides, but I've given you the two major ones. 
What would be the downside of such a machine? It takes a lot of instructions to do anything. That's right, yes. And that's, I don't have it here, but uh, that's one of the trade-offs here. You will see in your homework question. Uh, you, you'll have more executed operations. Okay, what else? Yes. Two memory reliant. Two memory reliant. Uh, meaning that memory is slow. Oh, but if you can keep stuff in the stack, it's not that bad, right? And these machines, uh, uh, remember, when they were built, uh, these are, this is a hardware stack. It's a special place close by uh, the computation units. So if you do this purely in memory, yes. <laughs> but now you can have the stack as uh, a very fast hardware structure. Yes? Keeping track of what you've already put on the stack is harder when you're programming. Yes. So that's one of the things that uh, I wanted to emphasize. Right? Again, you made a choice with the, at the ISA level. Now it'll affect the programmer. It made hardware designers' life easier a little bit. And also it made performance maybe nicer, although there's a caveat. You have compact code, but you have more instructions. And you will see that caveat in your homework question. But if you cannot express your computations easily with the, with, uh, in a way that matches the stack behavior, this last and first out behavior, you're in, so, you're in uh, for some pain, right? What if you want to add arbitrary locations in the stack? Let's say you compute some values, and somehow you need to really access this value here. Well, too bad, tough luck. You cannot access it, right? Because the machine doesn't allow you to do that. Well, there is a way to do that, but you've got to work around it. You cannot just say, it's not like a register, right? It's not general purpose. Even though this is very close to your computation units, you cannot say, I'm going to access this. You have to access the top of stack. And that reduces uh, your programmability, because that reduces your expressibility, expressiveness of the ISA. You cannot perform operations on many values at the same time as well, because it's not flexible. You can only do operations only on the top n values of the, st of the stack. Make sense? So this is a nice, uh, I guess this is one example. It's actually Phil Koopman's book was a professor here, and it's online. You can take a look at it. Uh, I guess it was the new wave at that time, in 1989. But this is what the processor uh, kind of looks like, a stack machine looks like. Uh, you have, uh, well, you have a data stack. This is what this is. And you can cache the top of stack. That's what this machine did a little bit, because it's easier uh, to do that operation. And you have the program memory. It's very simple. That's the upside. And the operations, uh, I, I've told you about the postfix operations. Basically, you can express operations as postfix, right? I guess if you do 5 times 4 plus 2 times 10, this is nicely expressible, right? I guess divided by 5. There's a nice ordering on which you put these on the stack, right? You start with the, this part and then keep going. OK, and this is an example. I'm not going to go through this. OK, Okay. let's get back to these other machines. I'm not going to go into detail in any of these, but you can imagine. Now, what if you have a one address machine? You can have one register, which is the accumulator. Now you have a little bit more flexibility, right? You're not operating only on the stack while well, the stack is gone, but you can get a value into the single register and add it to any other memory location. Right. You get a little bit more flexibility with an accumulator-based machine. There's a little bit more complexity, although it's not too bad compared to a stack machine. Okay. Now, if you go to a two-address machine, uh, now you can have two operands. Well, what, what, what do you have with an accumulator? With an accumulator, basically you can do add A. And implicitly what happens is, let me change this to, I guess, C. You have some value in the accumulator. And this instruction essentially is this. Accumulator is equal to accumulator plus the value in memory location C. You're adding an arbitrary memory location to the accumulator. You can keep accumulating things now. It's also simple. Right? That's the advantage. 
Now, if you want to be more flexible, you can have two address machines or two operand machines. And the idea he here is your ad looks like this now. Add our source, our destination. Two operands. Well, what happens is this, this uh, looks like this actually. Our destination gets the value of our source plus our destination. You're really adding two values, except you're overwriting one of the registers with the value that you produce. This again, a little bit simpler than a three address machine that we have looked at here. You have two addresses instead of three, right? And your instructions are becoming bigger now, right? Yes? So with an accumulator, do you also still have a stack, or is it just the accumulator register? That's a, that's a good question. So in pure forms of these, you don't have any combination. But you can, you're the architect again. You can imagine combinations, right? But pure accumulator machines did not have any stack. They just had an accumulator. And it's, it's even cheaper than a stack, right? But the problem is you have to be able to express your computations such that you can accumulate. And accumulate is not just accumulation. You can do multiplication. You can do division on the accumulator, right? OK. So there are many trade-offs related to this. And this homework question will cover some of these. And you've already, uh, uh, we've already looked at some of these, right? Code size versus on-chip memory space. If you have an accumulator, your on-chip memory space is one register, right, for temporary values. If you have a stack machine, now you need to have a stack. If you have general purpose registers, now your on-chip memory space can be large, right? Uh, and you need to have kind of random access memory, where a stack doesn't have to be that way, right? OK. And execution time is a more complex equation, as you will see. OK, I'll uh, speed through these. One other example. Uh, there have been examples of all of these machines throughout history. PDP-11, which was actually one of the fastest machines of its time, perhaps the fastest machine, was a two address machine. It was like this. It had a four bit opcode, and an add instruction had two six bit operand sp specifiers. So it's a 16 bit instruction. Well, why did they have a two address machine? Because they wanted to have a 16-bit uh, instruction in the machine. And they still wanted to have enough registers. If you have limited bits to specify an instruction, you fall back to two address machine. Right? And again, that's a trade-off also. right? Do you have fewer registers, but more operands in an instruction? Or do you have more registers, but fewer operands in an instruction? Yes? So you had 64 registers? That's right. Yes. Wow. That's the trade-off they made. OK? Maybe the trade-off of having more registers. <coughs> but they were OK with having fewer operands. But there's a downside, right? One source operand is always clobbered with the result of the instruction. What if you do need that value later on? What if that value is live out for some other uh, instruction later on. Do you guys know the concept of live in and live out? Yes? Yes, you do. OK, good. So live out means basically, let me just, uh, a value that's stored in a register is needed by a later instruction. At that point in time, the value is live out. So if you clobber the value, let's say you're doing add R1, R2, which implicitly clobbers R2, which is the destination. But you do need the value of R2 for something else later on. Let's say you need the multiply that actually needs the value of R2 as it is here. Somehow you need to save this somewhere, right? So that's the downside of a two address machine. How do you ensure you preserve the old value of the source register if it's needed later? And what is the answer? Say it again? Back it up somewhere like another register. Okay, back it up somewhere else. That's right. And what does that mean? You move, right? So these machines have a lot of move operations. 
So before clobbering, before doing the add on R2, you need to move, I guess, R2 to some other register, R3. Well, what if you don't have enough registers? Spill. Yeah. yeah, then you need to spill, right? So you get into all of these trade-offs. OK. So x86 actually does have a lot of move operations. It's a two-address machine also. Uh, and it's also a memory, it's a memory machine, so you can do operations on memory locations uh, without going to registers. Alpha is a three-address machine. And it's also a load store machine. We'll get to this memory to memory and load store later on. What about MIPS? Yeah. Three address, right? OK. I guess you, you started doing the homework, so you should know this. It's a three address machine also. OK. But now you know the trade offs between these machines. Three address machine requires more bits, basically. Or you give up something else, or fewer registers for a given instruction size. OK. OK, what are the other elements? Uh, instructions, we've covered this. An instruction consists of an opcode and an operand specifier. Right? How, to obtain the, uh, how to obtain the operand is also called an addressing mode. There are different ways of obtaining the operand. And we'll take a look at that, mainly in the next lecture. But I'll cover some of that too. Why are there different addressing modes? I guess I'll give you an example of an addressing mode. Well, we've seen one of them, right? <laughs> One of them is this. Do you get the address from a register? Uh, do you get the value from a register, or do you get the value from the instruction itself? It's a different addressing mode, right? This is the immediate or literal addressing mode, and this is the register addressing mode. And you can imagine other addressing modes. There's register plus displacement addressing modes, or called base plus index addressing mode. There are many different ones that we will see. Some of them you may not want to see later on, but <laughs> complex ones. Why are there these different addressing modes? Is it really, maybe we're going to say something. Since you can fit uh, more types of things and less bits. That's right, yeah, types of things. That's, I think that's the operative word. You operate on different data types, right? And data type is a fundamental uh, component of the ISA also. A data type is essentially a representation of information for which there are instructions in the ISA that operate on that representation. An integer, floating point, character, binary, decimal, binary coded decimal, these are all data types in x86. So you can actually do a decimal operation. Uh, but actually, x86 doesn't have decimal, I believe. It does have binary coded decimal, though. And I'll let you, I'll let you figure out what that is if you do not know that. Uh, but uh, an ISA specifies all of these also. If you have an instruction that operates on a particular uh, representation of information, that's a data type in the ISA. Now, programming languages also have data types, right? And uh, for example, a, a Q could be a data type in a programming language. It can be a data structure also. But it could be a data type as well, right? Which means that uh, you can have languages that actually have a queue as part of your uh, fundamental data structures. But the ISA doesn't need to support all of them, right? The only data type an ISA might have could be integer data types. And there have been ISAs, I will get to that, I think, somewhere here, that have only integer data types. Now it turns out that's not a good idea because that's not a good match with the programming model. But there are more complex data types also. As I told you earlier, there were ISAs that operate on doubly linked lists. And VAX, for example, VAX is an instruction called ins queue, insert into the queue or remove from the queue. Basically, these were operating on a doubly linked list or a, doubly, uh, uh, or a queue. And maybe we'll get to that uh, again uh, in the next lecture. Or it had an instruction called find first. Can you guess what that is? No, no, that, that would be nice also, actually. But this was not a, not a cue. This was finding the first set bits in, a, a, in an array of bits. 
So you can, you, you can imagine why ins insert into the queue and remove into the queue is useful, right? Because if you have a big data structure, uh, you may want to insert and remove from a database, for example. Find first is also useful, uh, especially in resource allocation. If you're allocating a resource as an operating system, for example, let's say uh, you have different pages and you have a bit for each page and you want to figure out which page is empty, right? Or which processor is not busy. You want to find the first processor that's not busy in this bit vector. That's a simple instruction. You do that very quickly, right? So you can imagine many different uses for this. And this is actually a beautiful book. I haven't assigned this reading, but <laughs> if, you're, if you're curious about any of these, you can take a look. And it's a beautifully written and described manual also, compared to many other manuals that are present today in 2012. Uh, uh, they, they actually took care to write this manual, I think, very nicely. So x86 has similar instructions. For example, the scan opcode operates on character strings. Its scan is very similar to find first, actually, in terms of its uh, uh, semantics. x86 <coughs> operates on stack. So there's a stack, is a data type in x86. You can do pushes and pops. Okay, so these are more complex data types. And these do determine your addressing modes. Okay, I'll pose you one question and then we'll take a break. What is the advantage of having these different data types or high level data types in the ISA? It makes it easier for the programmer that's using ISA to uh, do higher level implementations. That's right. Basically, the mapping between the high level language and the ISA is very close, right? If you have a doubly linked list, it's very easy to just use an instruction that implements that. So this makes life easier for the programmer if the programmer is programming in assembly, but it makes life easier for the compiler also, right? Especially if the high level data type matches the operations that are, uh, uh, that are supported. What is the disadvantage though? Yes? Hardware complexity. Hardware complexity. Again, this is another example that I promised uh, to give you many, many times during this course, right? Again, compiler, programmer complexity versus microarchitecture complexity. Right. The disadvantage of having these high level data types is now somebody needs to implement them. And if you have more and more, it'll be become more it'll become more difficult. Yes. So even for compiler designers, who wants to deal with like some weird instruction that you have to read about in the reference manual? So yes, you could argue that way also. And this is that's why this is kind of art. There's no perfect answer in this case. For a compiler designer, uh, you could argue, and people have argued, that fewer options is better. Like x86 is an instruction mode pi, mm -hmm. but I'm going to read the code, oh, they loaded pi, I'll just use the instruction. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right, and people have argued that way. Uh, if you have few options, if you have one single data type, you can optimize a compiler writer to actually just do everything with that data type, right? Now, it's good. One is too small, maybe. <laughs> Maybe you need to have some, pri uh, some fundamental uh, primitives. But if you, if you add too many, now the compiler writer also has many, many different choices. Which one are you going to choose? And there's another problem, right? It's not clear which choice is faster in hardware. So having fewer choices that are very clearly specified in terms of their performance is better for the compiler writer, usually, than having many choices which are unclear. And this was one of the motivations for the simple instruction ISAs, actually. Uh, VAX, uh, maybe I'll get to this, actually. There you go. Yeah, I guess I, I won't get to it exactly. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll cover this more in the next lecture. But VAX had an index instruction. And I believe what you could do with this index instruction is index into a three-dimensional array where you could check the bounds of each array. So you imagine something like this. A, I, J, K. And I don't remember if it's exactly three, but let's, let's take it as three. The instruction, with a single instruction, you could do this plus much more. Much more meaning uh, the hardware checks. So you could do it. Let's say register five equals base address, index, index, index. 
Uh, and plus the hardware checks whether this i is within bounds of this dimension. This j is within bounds of this dimension and k is within bounds of that dimension. And if there is any out of bounds error, then it would throw an exception. Yes? Yeah, it would throw an exception. Let's assume, but the hardware does all of this in a single instruction. So you have a multi-dimensional array as your data type, right? It's expensive in terms of hardware implementation. It, was a, it had a microcode implementation. Internally, this instruction was translated into many different micro operations in, uh, in the VAX architecture. Now it turned out that uh, some people did experiments and they figured out that this VAX, VAX index instruction ran like a dog. Meaning if you actually did this indexing with a single index instruction, it was much slower than implementation that used, that used add, load, multiply, Compare, you need compares for the checks, right? Branch and dot, dot, dot. If the compiler generated this code versus the single instruction, it turned out, I, I believe this was maybe 40x faster. That was the result in the late 70s. And this was a motivation for designing architectures that, are, that had much simpler instructions. And reduced instructions at computer term came about at that time. I guess you can read uh, Patterson and Ditzel's paper. A case for a reduced instructions at computer. So that was the idea. Because now the compiler can actually rearrange the operations also, right? Whereas here, it's purely up to the hardware designer. You have a single instruction, and if the hardware designer did not put effort into implementing this instruction, which was the case with the VAX architecture, the way VAX uh, architects designed this uh, system was they looked at programs, they figured out how many times this index instructions actually appeared in the programs. Not many times. So they didn't put much effort into optimizing the index instruction in the hardware. They needed to do it. It's part of the interface, right? But they didn't support it to be high performance. In that case, of course, the instruction is kind of useless, right? <laughs> but if they act actually spent the effort to optimize this, potentially you could, this could be much faster than this case. In fact, later, uh, Bob Colwell, uh, in other papers, showed that, uh, or argued at least that, uh, complex instruction set architectures are not necessarily bad if you optimize these instructions. So this is called the risk versus cyst debate in computer architecture. It's, it's, it's turned into more of a religious debate, but I'll give you the fundamental concepts. It's really, again, complex instructions are good for some purpose, single instruction, code size very small. It's easy to map as a high level uh, language, uh, as a compiler or a programmer. Simple instructions, code size large, but hardware is simple, right? Here hardware is more complex, okay? But if you optimize the hardware, you can get better performance with the Cisco architecture. And Actually, the, the most uh, successful architectures of their time have been CISC architectures for a long time, interestingly. But there are other reasons for this also, uh, like market reasons. For example, VAX is a very complex architecture. x86 is a very complex architecture. Uh, whereas these risk architectures that we will cover in a little bit more detail, MIPS is an example of that. Or alpha or ARM is an example of the risk architecture also. They have simple instructions with few data types, few addressing modes. Okay. Okay, I think I'll get to the semantic gap when we talk about uh, uh, complex versus simple instructions a little bit more. Uh, 
But I guess, I guess I'll cover it right now, why not? You have this high level language here. And in the end, what you're trying to do is execute instructions via some control signals in the hardware, right? Semantic gap refers to how complex where you draw the line for your ISA. So your ISA could be very close to your high level language, which is the case with the index instruction, right? Or your ISA could be very far away from your high level language, which looks kind of like this. Simple instructions that can be decoded very quickly. And the concept of semantic gap is how much gap there is between your high level language and your hardware software interface. This is one of the most fundamental trade-offs when you're designing an ISA. Where do you place the ISA? How complex do you want it to be? And this does affect many things. This does affect what data types do you support? Because data type is a function of your hardware uh, high level language, right? If you want to, you may want to support everything that's supported by a high level language. Uh, it does affect what type of instructions you have. It does affect your addressing modes, because that's dependent on your data types. Right? How do you compute an address? It does affect uh, the complexity of your instructions. Okay? So a CISC ISA usually draws a line here, or close to high level language. More complex instructions, more complex data types, more complex addressing modes. A RISC ISA, reduced instruction set computer ISA, draws the line closer to the control signals. And again, keep thinking, compiler, programmer versus microarchitect. Okay, that's the concept of semantic gap. Okay, uh, one example, I guess we're still talking about data types, although this does, the semantic gap affects many, many things in the ISA. Early RISC architectures, uh, after the, some of these results, there was a backlash against CISC, complex instructions. So early risk architectures took it to the other extreme, almost. Only one data type, integer. It turned out they figured out this was not a good idea. Why? Because there were many applications that needed floating point operations. Now, how do you do floating point operations fast when the only data type in your machine is integer? Well, you have a loop that emulates floating point, right? And that loop takes hundreds or thousands of instructions, depending on how big your floating point operations are, uh, floating point data width is, right? So now, I believe all RISC architectures have floating point data types. But initially, when MIPS started, when alpha started, well, actually, when MIPS started, there was no, uh, no floating point operation. Another example. No multiply operation. Why? Because if you want to be minimalist, you don't need a multiply operation, right? You just need shifts and adds, and a branch, and a compare, maybe. <laughs> well, it, it turns out when you do multiplies using those primitives, it runs like a dog again. It's nicer to have a specialized multiplier that is controlled by a multiply instruction. Right? So now all risk architectures, again, have multiply instructions. So these extremes are not necessarily good. And people have actually proposed other extremes also. Why not put the ISA right at the control signal level? <laughs> You're saying no, but this actually, this was actually uh, how risk really came about, if you will. This is the idea of John Koch at IBM, uh, late 1970s. This is much before the results that showed that uh, index instruction ran like a dog. And the idea he had was op open microcode. Basically, your control signal is your ISA. The compiler generates the control signals directly. It's great for a compiler, right? Now it can optimize as much as it can. The, the, the advantage, the compiler, the software has pure control. It can optimize very well, right? It can orchestrate the entire execution of the machine. Disadvantage, very, very complex compiler, right? Another advantage, hardware is simple. Hardware just gets the control signals and applies them, right? Every cycle, let's say. 
This advantage again, compiler is very, very complex. So I don't believe anyone built this machine, but it was a, a revolutionary concept at the time. And this did lead into a lot of research in how to design much more sophisticated compilers that can optimize the code significantly. And I believe John Cock won the Turing Award for that, for starting this concept and uh, doing a lot of work in optimizing compilers. Okay, so there are many trade-offs you can make as an architect, right? And there have been machines at the opposite end also that took high-level language and executed them directly. I guess one other example, in terms of data types, uh, is Intel 432. Uh, even though early RISC machines had only one data type, Intel 432 was an experiment in complexity almost. The idea was to have a data type that had objects. So you could actually have an object uh, and uh, uh, you could specify what type of object each memory location belonged to. This was more programmable, it was not uh, uh, burnt into the hardware. So you could actually specify objects, uh, different kinds of objects. And I'll let you read that. This also had other, uh, uh, other things, like it was a capability-based machine. So every single object had access control on it. So you could say, uh, you, you could specify whether a user is allowed to access this object or not access that object. I'll let you read it. We don't need to uh, cover this in detail. Uh, but I think before I move on to the next slide, uh, I'll give you one more thing here. I'm covering now the topics that I'm, I intended to cover next week, but this is how the, this is how the dynamic <laughs> flow of events happen, right? So one thing actually changes uh, the trade-offs that you make here. And that is the idea of <coughs> translation. And people have exploited this concept nicely. You can add another layer of indirection here which changes the trade-offs. So you could have an interface. Let's say, let's say uh, actually, let me do this. Let me erase this. You have high-level language control signals. You place your ISA here. Let's say you placed your ISA too high somehow. And that that's could be the x86 ISA, for example. But you do want to get the advantages of a simpler ISA, simple hardware, better optimization opportunity. Well, why not add another layer? Translation layer, and translate this ISA to a micro ISA. And build the hardware layer here. So this is the interface that's exposed to the programmer. This is the interface where the machine is actually built at. These are the operations that the machine executes. Didn't Say it again. Didn't someone try that? That's right. Do you know the company that tried it? That's right. They tried in one way, but actual uh, x86 processors are designed almost like this way also. So uh, the transmitter company. Uh, that you mentioned, what they did was they took the x86 ISA and they had a software layer that translated every single instruction to a micro ISA, which was actually a VLIW ISA, which is somewhere here, I believe. There you go, VLIW, remember? Multiple independent operations packed together into a single instruction. Why did they do this? Well, because it was hard to build a machine that executed efficiently, for them at least, every x86 operation. But it was much easier to build the software that took the code written in x86 and translated into another machine that implemented VLIW architecture very simply. And this machine could be even higher performance. And they did design machines that way. This way, the hardware now can remain simple, but you can also execute x86 software, the entire software stack, assuming the software works correctly. Right? So that's the idea. Now you can change the trade-offs. As an architect, you can have this indirection layer 
that enables you to design a machine that can execute any ISA, but without constraining yourself to the trade-offs that were made at that ISA level. So another example, today's Intel processors, what they do is actually they take these x86 operations at the ISA level, and in hardware, they translate those operations to much more simple operations. So internally, it looks like an engine that executes simple operations. Uh, for example, you, you can have a scan operation in x86. Or another example from what you will implement, you can have a repeat move string operation. Have you guys looked at the homework yet? Do you know what that is? So the idea of a repeat move string operation is basically you take uh, a bunch of memory locations and you move that location, move, move a string to another location in memory. And that string is of arbitrary length. x86 has these string operations. And you will, you, you will write code that takes advantage of that uh, for your homework. Again, that's very high level, right, in x86. You can copy two strings. Uh, you can even compare two strings in x86 with a single instruction. You can move one string to one, from one memory location to another memory location. Well, today's x86 processors don't implement that as a, simple, a single instruction. Internally, they translate that string operation, let's call it string move, into, uh, I guess, add, multiply, compare, load, store and a loop. It's very much similar to, instead of implementing this index operation directly, you implement it as small micro operations. And how, does, how is it done? It's not exposed to the programmer. The programmer writes string move. The hardware translates that dynamically into a sequence of instructions that are much simpler. Benefit, again, the hardware is much simple now because you're executing this micro ISA that's invisible to the programmer. Right. So the key takeaway, there is a semantic gap between the high-level language and the ISA that determines the trade-offs, but adding one level of indirection, you can change those trade-offs as an architect. Okay, I guess let's take a break for uh, five minutes and we'll continue from Okay, I guess the last thing is, uh, you covered Intel 432 very briefly, but I'll recommend a book for you if you're interested in that more. This was not a successful machine at its time, but it was very revolutionary at its time. This is uh, late 1970s, early uh, 80s. Okay, if you forgot, we were looking at what are the elements of an ISA, and this was uh, based on the data, uh, we looked at the data types and some of the trade-offs which are affected by where you actually place the ISA itself. Uh, memory organization is another fundamental thing in the ISA. It's an element of the ISA. Uh, address space, how many uniquely identifiable locations do you have in the memory is an ISA concept, right? An ISA specifies that. Addressability, again, how much data does each uniquely identifiable location store? Can you identify a single bit in memory? Can you identify a byte? Most ISAs today are byte addressable. You can basically operate on bytes. Uh, again, uh, this does change uh, your uh, complexity in hardware, right? And also programmability. Uh, for example, uh, Alpha, when it first started out, it didn't have byte operations. You couldn't load a byte. Everything was based on words. It was word addressable. It turned out, again, this was not good for programmability. A lot of programmers programmed using bytes. Can you guess why? Character is a byte. Character is a byte. Another example? Where I guess where a character is used? It's somewhere around here, if I can find it. Remember, oh, uh, yeah, there you go, right? This. Images, yes. Yeah, pixels, right? Yeah, pixels that are small, bitmaps, exactly. You do want to operate on bytes there. 
so they added these load byte and store byte operations. There were bit addressable machines also. You could identify a single location. And Burroughs 1700, which was a very unique machine of its time in the 70s. You could address every single bit. You could do bit operations. Load bit, store bit, add bit. Can you guess why this is good? It's maybe a little bit harder to guess. So they wanted this machine to be able to emulate many different ISAs. And not all ISAs have the same data type and data size or address sizes, right? So they wanted maximum flexibility in the underlying architecture so they could do bit operations at that level. It's very flexible, right? Some supercomputers were only 64-bit addressable. You couldn't address uh, elements that are big, uh, smaller than 64 bits. Again, can you guess why? Why? Because the, they didn't really deal with smaller data types, right? They had large, uh, large elements within their vectors to operate on. Uh, yeah, first alpha, I've told you that 32-bit addressable. I guess this is, I'll leave you with some of these questions for you to think. I'm not going to answer them, but uh, it's interesting to think about some of these things. How do you add two 32-bit numbers with only byte addressability? And how do you add two 8-bit numbers with only 32-bit addressability? It's doable, but it does require more effort on your part. If you had, well, I guess it's e the first is easier. The second one is harder. Right? You can access only words when you access memory, and you want to add two 8-bit numbers together. Now you need to mask some things. You need to shift, right? OK, I'll let you uh, think about this. And we'll cover big endian versus little endian. There's a question in your homework related to this also. But this is, this is really just a convention. This basically tells you if the most significant byte uh, of a longer word, let's say, of a multibyte uh, entity, is that at the low byte in memory or at the high byte in memory? Right. That's big endian versus little endian. Uh, Big endian means most significant byte uh, is the most important one. If it's at the low byte, it's big endian. Right? The important one is at the end. <laughs> little endian, the important one, uh, the little one is at the end. The less important one is at the end. That's how I try to remember these things. But it's just a convention. But it does affect your complexity a little bit. Uh, the other thing in the ISA that's related to memory is the support for virtual memory. Whether do you, do you have virtual memory or not? Now, you all know about virtual memory, right? From 213? OK. Even that's a choice, right, in the ISA. How is that virtual memory supported in the hardware software interface? And we will cover that uh, in more detail later on. So if you want to dig deeper, these are some recommendations. Uh, this is a fun to read paper, although it may be a little bit uh, tough to uh, penetrate into a little bit. Uh, but it's, it talks about the design of the Burroughs 1700 that I just described to you uh, with, with nice colorful language. So I recommend reading that paper if you're really interested in it. I'm not going to test you on any of these papers, by the way, but this is for those of you who want to really dig deeper. It's a beautiful paper, actually. Uh, and this is uh, a little bit more dull and dry, but it does give you a good idea of how object management is done in the... Uh, Intel 432 processor. And this you can, get, you can access online. Actually, even this one you can access online. But you don't need to buy the book. Uh, the book is The Capability-Based Computer Systems by Hank Levy. That was written in 81. Uh, it covers how you design a system that has capabilities, basically. Uh, access control uh, uh, done uh, by capabilities, meaning users. Uh, you can specify the capability of each user in accessing an object. So each object is an access control list. You can think of it that way in memory. How do you do that? It's slow. But people have tried to design machines that way. And this is a book about that, and it has a chapter on uh, Intel 432. OK. I guess we're moving on to other elements of an ISA. Register is another fundamental component of an ISA, right? How many registers and size of each register, those are specified by the ISA. It's why it's, uh, not all ISA side registers. Right? 
But people over time came to realize that registers might be a good idea. Well, I guess uh, we've already talked about stack computers that didn't have registers, right? A pure stack computer doesn't have a register. But why is having registers a good idea? Locality. Locality, yes. Because programs exhibit locality, right? Data locality. What does data locality mean? If you're accessing uh, a recently produced value, or you, if you're accessing a value that you recently accessed, it's likely that you're going to access it again. This is called temporal locality also, more specifically. And a register essentially exploits this, right? You bring that frequently accessed value and you store it much closer to the processor through programmer support or compiler support and keep accessing it. Uh, and storing that value in a register eliminates the need to go to memory each time. And we will, exp we will exploit this concept in different ways later on when we get to memory hierarchy. And you know this from 2.13 again. A register file is essentially a cache, right? Except it's managed explicitly by the programmer. Right? You can think of it that way. Now later we will cover caches that are managed implicitly, automatically, by the hardware. You bring hardware, instead of uh, uh, having, uh, having to access memory all the time, it has this fast memory that's closer to the processor, that's small, and automatically caches values that are recently accessed, or maybe frequently accessed. And this management is automatic. The programmer doesn't need to deal with it. Whereas the register file, you can think of it the same way, right? Except now the programmer is involved. The programmer needs to specify what value goes to what register. Right. So that's the difference. So when we get to memory hierarchy, we'll see the same concept in a different way. OK. Um, we, we keep talking about programmer visible state. I want to clarify this. This is also called the architectural state. The state of a machine that's visible to the programmer is called architectural state. And we'll use that a lot during the course. And if you look at this, program counter is visible to the programmer. It's me it contains the memory address of the current instruction. Memory, area of storage locations indexed by an address that's visible to the programmer. And we're going to add registers to it. Registers are visible to the programmer also. Uh, and they could be general versus special purpose, as we will see next in the next slide. Uh, but the state of the machine that's not visible to the programmer is called the microarchitectural state. It's again, ISA versus microarchitecture. Caches are normally not visible, except they're visible through some instructions. Okay, and instructions specify how to transform the values of the programmer visible state. Right. Okay, yeah, I think I've already given you this. Cache state or pipeline registers, programmer cannot access this directly, unless you expose them, but normally not. Okay, register architectures have evolved also. The simplest register architecture is an accumulator. Right? This is your, uh, from the adding calculator machine days. Then later people added uh, not only an accumulator, but registers, just to special purpose registers to contain the address. Uh, and the idea is uh, you have these address registers, and the sole purpose is you load the address register, and later the memory gives the value back. That's it. Why? Why do you want to do that? Because you want to be able to have, uh, you don't want to clobber your accumulator with your address. You want to be able to do address computation as well as data manipulation at the same time. And that's why machines evolved that way. If you look at IBM 36091, it, it does have address registers or CDC 6600, Control Data Corporation 6600, which we will get to. These are two machines that actually implemented out of order execution for the first time in the uh, 60s, 1960s. And uh, as an aside, Control Data Corp Corporation, a very small company, was a big competitor to IBM at the time, and they did design a much faster machine. Okay, anyway, uh, but they had these address registers that were special purpose, and eventually uh, they became more general purpose over time. Uh, they started supporting arithmetic on the addresses instead of just having a dumb register that you load and returns back the data. Now you could do arithmetic. But now once you start doing arithmetic on all of your registers, why not have a general purpose register file, right? You actually, all registers are good for all purposes now. Uh, and 
32 registers is common for RISC. You, you will see it in alpha. I believe MIPS also has 32 registers, right? Okay, good. I can never remember MIPS for some reason. <laughs> uh, and uh, some architectures have larger registers also. IA64, for example, has 128. Okay, and we'll, we'll get back to that register uh, file trade-offs in the next lecture. But there are also instruction classes. Uh, I'll give you some more terminology. Operate instructions, these are basically to process data. Uh, it could be arithmetic or logical. Basically, you need to fetch operands, compute the result, and the store the result. And you get implicit sequential control flow with the operate instructions, right? Uh, data movement instructions, these move data between memory, registers, and I.O. devices. And again, implicit sequential control flow, and control flow instructions change the sequence of instructions that are executed. Uh, another uh, property of the ISA is, is the ISA load store versus memory to memory. Meaning, uh, in load store architectures, operate instructions, uh, this, uh, uh, whether or not an ISA is load store or memory to memory is specified by where are the operands of an operate instruction, where can they come from? In a load store architecture, operate instructions can operate only on registers. So you have to bring data into the registers to operate on them. Whereas in a memory to memory architectures, operate instructions can operate on memory locations directly. You don't have to bring the data into the registers. Now you can think about the implications of that, right? This is more complex, obviously, for the hardware, because now any instruction, any operate instruction, can have an operand in memory. This is simpler, load store architecture is simpler because you have a very clear distinction between data movement and operate. Only data movement instructions, load, store, access memory. Everything else, operate instructions, access the registers. And that's why you see the risk versus sys distinction here again, right? MIPS, ARM, alpha, they're all load store architectures. Now we can think about the performance implications as well. I'm not gonna go into that right now, but uh, you might not want to bring every, uh, you, might not want to, you might want to operate directly on memory sometimes, right? If you do not have locality in your instruction stream, let's say all you do is stream through this array and add one to it. Add one to each memory location. What's the point of bringing every single element into the register, adding one, and storing the data back? Right. Why not just have, uh, and clobbering your registers in the meantime? Maybe if you had the option of having memory operations directly, uh, having operate instructions directly modify memory locations, you can use the registers for those data values that have more locality. Right. So that's the idea. There is, a, there is an advantage to this architecture, yes? So for like memory, memory, is that something that might be in the ISA, but could be like masked by an interface that, so underneath it's not actually? Oh, that's right, exactly, yes. Underneath, what you can do is you can bring every data value into registers. You're absolutely right. This is what's exposed to the programmer. But then those registers uh, need to be provided by the hardware somehow. The hardware itself cannot clobber the registers that are exposed to the programmer. Oh, that was your question? Okay, good. <laughs> because if it clobbers now, it becomes visible to the programmer and now you're not obeying the specification of the ISA, okay? So underneath you can do anything as long as you don't expose it to the programmer. As long as you obey that interface. And you will see a lot of interesting things hopefully. Okay, so x86 and VAX are memory to memory architectures. They do operate purely on registers, but they also operate directly on memory. For example, you can increment a memory location directly in x86. You can do string compare on memory locations in x86. Okay, addressing modes is another example uh, of a fundamental uh, component of an ISA. These specify how to obtain the operands, and I'll give you some examples here. I'm not gonna cover all of these. These are from actually MIPS, so these are useful for your project. Absolute addressing mode, basically you use the immediate value as your address. Uh, register indirect, basically you use the value in the register. 
register plus offset, also called displaced or based addressing mode in MIPS, you basically uh, get the register value from the register file with the base register and add an offset to it to compute the address. Indexed, you can basically, you can add two registers and that forms your address. Memory indirect, now you get the value in the register and then use it as an address to index memory. And there's also auto increment and decrement. Uh, this is probably the more interesting one here. Uh, basically you can use the be, uh, value in the register, base register as the address, but after using it, or before using it, you increment or decrement the register. Meaning you increment or decrement the address. Can anyone guess why this is useful or why? Yes? Accessing arrays. Accessing arrays. So if you're, yeah, go ahead. Uh, or you know, going through a stack. Yeah, so if you're sequentially accessing uh, memory locations, this automatically increments your address such that your address is ready for the next uh, instruction, right? If you do not have this, then you need two instructions. One to load, the next one to increment or decrement the address. Here we're combining the functionality of two instructions together. Automatically incrementing the address and accessing memory location. This saves instruction space. Actually, we might, we might want to talk about uh, we, we will probably get to that as well. So this is uh, addressing mode. This is another example of the trade-off that you make between the programmer and the microarchitect. If you have more addressing modes, uh, we've already covered this, but this enables better mapping of high-level constructs to the machine. And some accesses are better expressed with a different mode, like auto-increment mode, right? If you're sequentially accessing an array, auto-increment mode is probably better than uh, which one? This one, register indirect mode, right? Because here, if you use this one, you need to have an add instruction <coughs> to increment the address. Um, if you do pointer chasing, perhaps this memory indirect mode is nice, right? Because that saves you another load access. Instead of doing two loads, you're doing one load. Or uh, let, me, let me put it that way, in a more precise way. Instead of specifying two loads as two instructions, you're specifying one instruction. Right? Underneath the machine may need to access memory twice again. Right? Okay, uh, and there are other accesses, and we will get to this. I'll show you some examples of the addressing modes from x86. Disadvantage, now uh, actually having more addressing modes uh, provides more work for the compiler. One of the reasons is what you suggested, right, earlier. Now the compiler needs to choose between many different addressing modes, which one is better. And more, definitely more work for the microarchitect. Microarchitect has no choice. They have to implement all of the addressing modes. Uh, you will hear the term orthogonal ISAs. Uh, orthogonal ISA means, uh, an ISA is orthogonal if all addressing modes can be used with all instruction types. It's another thing that's nice for the compiler, actually, because now the compiler doesn't need to figure out what it can use and what it cannot use. If everything can be used with everything else, then the compiler can generate correct code easily. Right. Uh, VAX was actually an orthogonal ISA. Uh, it had 13 addressing modes. And you can imagine what those are, perhaps. <laughs> and it had more than 300 opcodes. I didn't count, but someone might have the count. Now you can imagine how many different combinations there are. And it also had integer and FP formats. So if you multiply all of these, the hardware designer's job becomes harder, right? Okay, but that's, uh, that's what you get with orthogonality. Okay, I guess I'll, I, I've already told you this. Who is this good for? It's good for the compiler. Compiler doesn't need to figure out special cases. Who is this bad for? It's bad for the microarchitect, right? They have to design this. Now it may be bad for the compiler because not all addressing modes may be efficiently supported uh, in hardware. So a compiler may generate code with one addressing mode, but if it had generated code with some other addressing mode, it would have been much faster. Okay, how to interface with I.O. devices and another element of the ISA, and you probably covered this in a previous course, right, 213? Yes? Okay, so you could have memory mapped I.O., a region of memory can be mapped to the devices. 
And IO operations are simply loads and stores to those locations now. So interfaces just load and store, accessing a device is no different from accessing memory. Or you could have special IO instructions. For example, in x86, there are in and out instructions that deal with different ports of the chip. Uh, now we have uh, trade-offs related to this. We're not going to cover this in detail, but you can think of this. This is another ISA level trade-off that an architect needs to make. Which one is more general purpose? Memory map is more general purpose, right? You can add any device and memory map it and it just works, right? Whereas with in and out, now it's more special purpose. What if you run out of ports? Well, you need to do something like maybe virtualize the ports, but then it becomes, it becomes closer to memory mapped actually. <laughs> Except it's not memory that you're virtualizing, it's really the ports. Okay, I'll let you <coughs> figure it out. Okay, I think this will, this will be the last slide I cover, and I'm not gonna cover all of this in detail, obviously. It's another of those 10 hour <laughs> slides perhaps. But uh, privilege modes is another element of an ISA. Uh, user versus supervisor is perhaps the simplest privilege level. You have two levels. But there will be machines with many different levels. This determines who can execute what instructions, right? Can the user execute system instructions? Most ISAs say no to that. Because you need to have some level of security Every program should not be able to crash the system, right? Exception and interrupt handling, we'll cover this. Basically, what procedure is followed when something goes wrong with an instruction? That's an exception. An exception is inherent to the process that's running. An interrupt is external to the process that's running. Basically, what procedure is followed when an external device, for example, requests a processor, when power uh, is shut down? to the machine, when an error happens. These are all external events. And again, ISA specifies how the system should behave under those conditions. And when we cover exception and interrupt handling, we'll talk about some other choices. Should the exception and interrupts be vectored versus non-vectored? For example, you get a, a signal from a device. Uh, vectored means the device records its ID somewhere saying that uh, I am the device that interrupted you, right? And you take uh, the device ID and index into a interrupt vector table to figure, to figure out which interrupt service routine should be executed. But not all machines are like that. It could be you just get a signal saying some device interrupted the processor. Now it's the processor's interrupt service routine's responsibility to figure out which device actually interrupted. This is called a non-vectored interrupt which was early MIPS, for example, had non-vector interrupts. Simple, right? Simple meaning hardware is simple. And the processor, when it uh, executes the interrupt service routine, the first thing that it does is goes through every device. Did you interrupt me? Did you interrupt me? Did you interrupt me? Maybe not a good idea. Vectored is usually better uh, today. Virtual memory, we've talked about this. Each program has the illusion of the entire memory space with virtual memory, which is greater than physical memory. But that's also, again, specified by the ISA. And access protection is also specified by the ISA. And in today's systems, these two are relatively coupled. You do access protect protection within virtual memory, but they don't have to be. OK, I think I'll stop here. Uh, have a good weekend. Start on your homework. And well, we won't meet for uh, Monday, since it's MLK Day.